Hi, everyone. Uh, very happy to be back after my paternity leave. And just as a reminder, the new release schedule will be every two weeks for the full episodes uh, and once a month for the AMAs. Uh, so this week, my guest is Duncan Trussell. Duncan is a comedian, best known for his podcast, The Duncan Trussell Family Hour, and his Netflix series, The Midnight Gospel. He routinely explores topics relating to spirituality in his comedy, uh, particularly the works of teachers such as Ram Dass and Jack Cornfield. This episode was recorded before my son was born, and we discuss my impending fatherhood, uh, DMT, and the Back to Yoga Path of Love. Hope you enjoy the conversation. What's right, the name of your to... podcast? Uh, Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. Um, it's a reference to every theory of consciousness called the Living Mirror Theory of Consciousness. Um, Ooh. Ooh. That I, yeah, published. What kind of um, doctor are you? Uh, PhD in neuroscience. Um, Amazing. Yeah, although ironically, my all of my neuroscientific study led me to the conclusion that the brain isn't what generates consciousness and it's actually the kind of embodied life process. So all living systems. You're not going to get funding with that theory. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's too, it's too uh, hippie ish, I think for a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I think it's, that's the whole living mirror thing is like being a living system. It's like you're creating a reflection uh, of the world around you. It's, it's very influenced by like, um, especially like Tibetan Buddhism, there's a lot of mirror analogies for the nature of consciousness and like, you know, this kind of clear, uh, this clear illuminating space that is unchanged by the contents that arises in it. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a very kind of non-dual perspective. So even though right. there are different consciousnesses, it's not the same thing as the ego. It's, it's, you know, it's more fundamental than the ego. It's your, yeah, consciousness is this like reflection in existence in a nutshell. Yeah, well, you all you got to do is come up with a name for it that doesn't sound like what it is, like the way Carl Rogers <laughs> came up with unconditional positive regard instead of love. It was brilliant. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. brilliant. Like, oh, okay, we just won't call it love because no one's yeah. funding love. But <laughs> unconditional positive regard, that sounds dry, right, right. dead, manageable, <laughs> and you're going to get that funding. You can sell that, yeah. Actually, I wanted to talk to you about, um, we both, I think, uh, have benefited a lot from Ram Dass and the whole kind of Bhakti, Bhakti yoga tradition. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you've, I've seen you speak elsewhere in the past on, um, on that, the kind of cynicism that, you know, people cloak themselves in against love, uh, yes. because it's so powerful, right? Like, I think, um, again, I've heard you speak about experiences that mirror my own of just how how insanely it kind of undoes you at your core if you really surrender fully to to yeah. you know and the kind of love we're talking about right is like it's just literally everything <laughs> that arises if if you can just be open to it um it's so powerful uh yeah is that part of your like ongoing practice at the moment well yeah i mean i've got kids you're about to so you're mm. you're gonna get a real taste of of what love like the deepest most primordial love there is and I think one of the big problems in the conversation of love, if you is that it's it's really a confusing word. It's like a bit like consciousness in in the sense that how do we define it? Like even right. when you mention love, some people when they hear that, they might think of one romantic love. Some other people might think of like some kind of uh, ambiguous, thing that they've read on uh, greeting cards or whatever but the the term itself i think it lacks a a, a consensus definition meaning that it much like compassion it would be easy to imagine oh i know what love is and that isn't even love at all it, that might be clinging many people think okay. that wanting someone or needing to be close to someone or like all of that equals love and it can be a quality of it but you know the, the what what would if you had to define love how would you define it yeah i mean yeah when i talk about it in this kind of more spiritual sense you know i there's definitely the that kind of clingy romantic attachment thing where often you're trying to work through all of your childhood issues in like in yeah. this kind of that's actually that's the thing most people i think well that's often used with to, when people talk about love and I'm talking about something completely different when I talk about it in this sense, which is very similar to, to mindfulness or just being aware of like being maximally open 
and accepting and surrendering. And so, uh, you know, you can, you can be mindful or meditate with a, a kind of cold clinical witnessing. Um, yes. but also like when you really are open to everything, it's this, this kind of radical openness that feels, it just feels wonderful. It feels warm and fuzzy and all of those kinds of things we associate with love. Um, and so, yeah, for me, for me, it's, it's almost a quality of consciousness, a very kind of pure bare bones version of, of love. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, that's where you get into the real, like quantum level of it, which is, well, can, can you separate consciousness from love? And this is in like mindfulness when people hear mindfulness, if they're critiquing it past the, some shit hippies talk about, then the critique often will be, it's too in your head. It's too analytical. It's too cold. And uh, I think that that is a, a, I understand why people would think that if they initially tried to practice mindfulness, because the initial practice of mindfulness, you feel like it, it can accidentally be equated with like more of an observation, like a, like a Vulcan ana analytical, right. non-emotional observation. But the, the more you practice mindfulness, the more you realize there's this uh, second sun that seems to be inside of you all the time. This this powerful thing underneath everything else is that that people equate with suffering, heartbreak. I mean, my God, what's the worst thing? Heartbreak. You don't want to get your heart broken. That's the worst thing. The term is in all the songs. It's a mournful experience. It's horrible. But the term itself, I think, it's like ridiculous in the sense of the implication outside of like, obviously, like physiologically, you can break your heart. But the idea being that there's this aspect of a person that can be shattered or broken or and the experience that people call heartbreak, I think, is the driveway. It, it can be the driveway into love. It's like when when you start feeling that you're on the right path. I just don't think people realize that sometimes when people start meditating this, they're like, what the fuck? I'm not happy. My, I feel my I, it's breaking my heart. This gets described in a lot of ways people will say i can't deal with the reality of suffering in the world I, I i can't handle the fact that this is i'm not closing off as much as i used to to the suffering of people animals the the the, the sum total of all suffering or, or whatever and 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 that doesn't feel great this does this isn't on the list when you're thinking of like why should i meditate it's not oh so that my heart will break so that I will feel incapacitated by a kind of sweet uh, sorrow, an almost unbearable sorrow. It gets described as, un quote, unbearable a lot. But I think that that is, that's when I think of love, that's it. That's, that's it. It's not always, the only reason it's, un it feels un unbearable or the only reason it feels like horrific at first is because well you're trying to stop it you're trying to control you've spent your whole lifetime working on these very sophisticated methods of ignoring it and and uh suddenly you're you know if we are practicing mindfulness it's got to be the opposite of ignorance we're no longer ignoring right and then right. suddenly you're like oh fuck oh my god and then whenever it's happened to me i'm always like oh this must be because of fill in the blank Oh, it's because I lost my mom, or oh, because I don't want to die, or oh, because whatever it may be. And 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 but I I think no, actually, that's not really there isn't there isn't really a reason for it, which is another horror at first. <laughs> because if there's a reason, <laughs> there's the hope for the, the 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 cessation. But you really the 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 thing you're looking to stop doing is clinging to whatever isn't that to try to like evade it you know right. and, and then the more that you sort of depending on where you're at in your own life the more you go like drop back you stop running away the moment that flickering you start the clouds part for a moment the moment you stop shielding your face from it then it becomes i think less 
uh, less, uh, it becomes increasingly bearable. Right. Yeah, I think the, I like what you're saying about the second sun inside you, because when I first kind of discovered this, this for myself, the thing that was astounding, I think, was that it's not like a capacity you have that can get worn out. It's this way of being that's just, it just kind of shines forth, like, relentlessly, if you tap into it, and it this this mode of just of being, and I think the way I think about it, you mentioned it kind of relating to non attachment, I feel like it's what I'm gesturing towards is, is, yeah, it's, it's kind of all the same thing of, of non attachment, um, mindfulness, just being really, I think when you can really truly surrender into just being that's what I'm calling this state of kind of unconditional love for everything that arises. But then you mentioned the kind of um, maybe the more back to the idea that the in the kind of the pain of it, this kind of bittersweet yearning longing, that that's also so I in my my kind of way I conceptualize this, I think often though the more negative, well, the more painful side of it, I might think of as like maybe that's that's like an egoic resistance or some you're working through something on like some egoic level. But then there is this whole other kind of way of looking at it where you say, well no, that is that is the union. That's the you know, there's that Rumi poem Love Dogs where he kind of talks about the the kind of the crying of the of the dogs being yeah being the union like it's not it's not that it's like waiting for it and it's going to come like that's it that's what this is what i you know this is what i what i love about bhakti yoga um is the you know whereas in sort of uh some of the non-dual teachings uh the methods of explanation can seem alien to people in the sense that we've always had a body we've always had a self and so the with the non-dual teachings, a lot of times you will find this kind of systematic deconstruction of the identity, which leads to this rev- the, the revelation the, 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 uh, of, of space or this uh, quality to oneself that uh, you may have only re- remotely been aware of. Or maybe like, you know, I used to think... Um, I, sentimentality. I would have sentimentality about when I used to work at a summer camp, how I felt uh, in those days. And I would all, I would just think, oh, that was well, that's what it feels like to be young. Of course, it felt good. And then, you know, in a, my sitting practice, every once in a while, suddenly I'm feeling that again. Like I'm there again, but I'm not, I'm old now. I'm not at a summer camp. I have all the responsibilities of being a householder and all that. And yet there it is, exactly the same, nothing different, but I'm not there. And so, you know, the the discursive mind immediately will say, oh, summer camp, or maybe Christmas, or uh, the great great meal you had with your family, or you're with your mother, or all these things. You try to tell a story about it, because it doesn't make sense that this thing could be not uh, non non conditional that it could be just there that it, it's just there it doesn't make sense that's the non dual version of it the bhakti version of it is that's the atman the para atman this is the place where your soul connects to the soul of the divine in those moments you are experiencing the darshan of krishna hanuman you fill in the kali who whatever it may be and uh, the reason I think bhakti yoga appeals to a certain mind frame is that it it's not just like that feeling, but rather it it, it has a way of connecting that that fee- the varying ways or the mellows as they call it that one can experience when you are cultivating bhakti, which is you cultivate it. You don't you're not even though you could argue you are born profoundly in love with God uh, over a lifetime or lifetimes, this amnesia sets in. So the love of God gets transferred to love of family, love of wealth, love of success, love of heroin, love of vaping, love of whatever it may be. And this is a, a, a confusion and that I think Bhakti is trying to set right. And so because we've had experiences relating to other people, the Bhakti stories are all about relationships. And so pining 
to get back to what we were talking about before, or what happens in Buddhism is you have those experiences and now your meditation gets disrupted by trying to recreate that somehow. And then this is, this is one of the big sand traps in uh, meditation practices. The next time you sit down on the mat, after you've had the transcendent experience, all you're thinking about is fuck, man, why aren't there any good movies out? Or I'm so pissed at that game on PlayStation or oh, my good dad or all this stuff. And then you get off the mat and you're like, fuck, I lost it. Well, Bhakti, I like Bhakti because it compares that to pining after a lover. So, you know, even like that, the thing that in the human realm can be neurotic, codependent, uh, dysfunctional in the, in one's attempts at connecting to the, the divine, it, it's no longer off limits. Any way that you are trying to once again, be in the presence of God, even though you already are, any way you're trying to jog the memory banks, whatever it may be, is good and acceptable. And so bhakti is the process of actually stoking that fire increasing 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 that wild longing which will not be a disappointment as all the other loves that you will have in the material universe inevitably at some point will disappoint at some point will not satisfy because it's limited whereas we're talking about something unlimited so i feel like one it's two different ways of talking about the same thing, uh, non-dual Buddhism and dualism, which I think bhakti, at least in the initial phases, depends on dualism to be articulated. Right. And it might be worth um, briefly explaining kind of um, how bhakti is practiced, because I think people will get the gist if they've not heard of it before from what we've said so far, but it might be worth just, yeah, explaining what bhakti yoga is. You want me to? If you don't mind, just a, a, a brief. Sure. So what, what we're talking about is my main experience with it is with the Hare Krishnas, which is known as Vaishnava Bhakti Yoga. The Hare Krishnas are the is the is the name and default reality given for the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, which is I guess you could compare it to a denomination of Christianity. But uh, many people don't understand there's so many flavors of bhakti out there that's just one and it's a it's a pretty rigorous flavor of bhakti yoga it's a i don't want to compare it to catholicism because i don't want like i'm not making any like even though i think you could probably make you could do some interesting analysis of the two and find where they're where they meet but um so in, in bhakti yoga the process of uh, cultivating bhakti or reigniting what the Hare Krishna is called Krishna consciousness is through the chanting of the Maha Mantra, which is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Now, in the, in the initial phases of it, they will say, you don't really need to know what it means. It doesn't matter. These are the names of God. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you have read the Srimad Bhagavatam, it doesn't matter if you've read the Bhagavad Gita, it doesn't matter right now if you eat meat, it doesn't matter how pure you are or how unpure you think you are, just start chanting. The very potency of these, uh, the names of God, will create a shift in consciousness that will begin to change you. And the changes look like suddenly the, the practices that you are engaged in, maybe you drink too much. Maybe you're a sex addict. Maybe you're angry. Maybe you are unhealthy. Maybe you are drawn towards um, habits that are not really making you happy. Those things, suddenly, weirdly, the attraction to them begins to lessen and the attraction to chanting the names of God increases. Why? Well, the explanation for that is that what do you want to keep eating McDonald's when you have this, like, you know, the, an, an, the most incredible chef in the universe living in your house. So it, suddenly you, the, those attachments that you thought were permanent, they lessen and lessen and lessen. And this is happening in conjunction 
with association with other devotees who are also practicing bhakti yoga and where it gets at least with iskon particularly controversial from the western mindset is in association with a guru or spiritual master so the uh practice of bhakti is a communal practice it is not a solitary practice so it can start off like that and within that practice there is the chanting of the holy names japa the uh singing of the holy names kirtan the worshiping of the deities puja and the celebration of the holy days which there are very very many within the bhakti yoga calendar days of fasting days of uh, jamastami the appearance date of lord krishna along with celebrations of all the various associates of lord krishna and jaitanya mahaprabhu who was uh, considered an incarnation of krishna that appeared in india to reignite the chanting of japa and so also among the practices of bhakti yoga are the telling of stories of krishna so if you are around devotees it, they will often tell the same story over and over and over again. And if you've been practicing and chanting, it never gets old. You want to hear it again and again and again. And, and this attraction is really what you're cultivating. You're cultivating this thirst, this pining quality, which is a holy thirst to know more and more and more about God until you're on fire with it. And at that point, you you have like and, and there's various phases of bhakti that's what's so cool about it is all of it is like none of it is ambiguous like it, when you hear about love it sounds ambiguous and bhakti yoga there is no ambiguity there it's like here are the phases here's what you can expect including an acknowledgement of places where you might not feel great you know uh, uh there, i think the term is a nartha navriti like it, you can like fry out like it can be almost too much where suddenly you're like uh it, it's a it's a weird a fascinating kind of like suffering and but all of it is mystical and beautiful and um purifying and so yeah that's as best as i can at least from my very limited understanding that's my articulation of the practice of vaishnava bhakti yoga it may differ with like uh, other deities but my main um connection has been through iskon that was great thank you and yeah, I, sure. um, I mean, as a scientist, like I, when I, I'm, I'm very interested in kind of, I guess, like synthesizing science and spirituality. And I think that can be done in a, in a neurotic way where you're, you know, uh, where there's too kind of much reifying your, your worldview. Um, but I think there's also like use in it to try, cause I think for a lot of people, if, if, um, especially you grew up in the West with like certain modes of Christianity, there can be a kind of a distrust of just kind of dogmatic just trust me on the supernatural stuff, you know, attitudes. Um, and so I, I guess I'm interested in where you land with your kind of whole worldview, because you've, you, you've, you know, consumed a lot of different, you have a lot of different influences from, you know, you're yeah. very tuned up on kind of scientific developments and uh, different spiritual traditions. But yeah, I'm interested, do you have like a kind of a worldview? Or do you think that's like a, a fool's errand? And actually, we shouldn't be so hung up on that. And it's more about the practice. Yeah, what are your, your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I think that like dismissing, like you shouldn't dismiss anything that you are like that wherever I, I, I think wherever you are is the, the like, you know, I, I, I one thing that always returns to my mind is the first few pages of Pima Chodron's The Wisdom of No Escape, where she, I believe it's the first few pages of that, where she says many people will start meditating because they want to become a better person. This is starting your spiritual practice with an aggression against yourself. So you, you, you start meditating not because you like who you are, but because you don't like who you are. And this is a, a um, th this, th this flies in the face of this, uh, this idea of mindfulness in the sense of mindfulness is in where, who am I? What is this thing? What are my thoughts? What is going on with my body? What are these like memories that I have? And what's going on under the surface all the time as I'm distracting myself with this and this and that. And when these things emerge, 
they're not to be met with a rejection, judgment, or suppression, but an open attitude of, oh, now look, there's that, or oh, there's that, the comparison between uh, meditation practice and sitting in the forest. You know, if you're sitting in the forest and you get still, you see all kinds of creatures suddenly that are, are, are maybe not aware you're there, just aren't afraid of you because you haven't been moving. I don't know. And when you're seeing them, you're not like, God, look at that fucking fat squirrel. That's the dumbest squirrel I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> that squirrel sucks at climbing trees. When, and yet, when a, you know, sometimes people are afraid to sit still and like see themselves. They think the reason is, is because it's unpleasant to sit still, but really the reason is because they know that they've cultivated this judgmental mind where they've been at war with themselves. And if they, God forbid, they sit still and aspects of themselves they've been ignoring show themselves. And it, it, because if they show themselves, then more self-hate will, they're, they're afraid they'll hate themselves that much more. So a worldview wherever you may be is a good, I think it's a good thing. It's, it's you, it's something you have. So I don't, my worldview uh, changes quite a bit uh, has evolved over time from sometimes not evolved, devolved over time. But the, uh, the so for, for me right now, just because I'm working with David Nickturn and I uh, am studying uh, Tibetan Buddhism more and more, uh, I, I find myself coloring my uh, world with a lot of ideas that I've been uh, re receiving from those channels. Right. But that and doesn't mean that I don't like sometimes go back, like talking about bhakti yoga and Krishna and listening to kirtans or like uh, reading the Bhagavad Gita or uh, all of these things, they still like, I love it so much. It's just uh, my focus at the moment is more in, in terms of uh, Buddhism. Right. And I think, I think it might have been Timothy Leary who gave a, a Tibetan yogi DMT at one point. I might be mangling this, might be a di different psychedelic, but there's definitely been speculations around the DMT realm being something like the Bardos in Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, what are your thoughts on on that? let's hope i mean that'll be great i hope that's right i i i, I, the, I my dmt experience have, has always been very positive and wonderful and so if that's the bardo i'm buying a ticket man I, I, I that's an exciting idea i the uh in the depictions of the bardo that i've read there does seem to be uh parallel to psychedelics uh set and setting uh in this case, I guess you could say set uh, your mindset. So the bardo is as it fits in well with your this reflectivity that you're interested in. The bardo is reflective, but kind of you could say mystically reflective, karmically reflective. So you might, you know, some people go through an entire lifetime never realizing that a lot of what they're seeing is their own projection, uh, their shadow side. So they might live in a very paranoid world where people are out to steal from them or get them or whatever, not even understanding they're seeing their own fear reflected back, but the, the, the surface it's reflecting back from is sentient and, and is adaptive. So, and also projecting. So within that re relationship of projections and paranoia, a person recognizing in you that you don't trust them naturally does so it affirms your projection but but through like a human body or maybe dogs or whatever so um your animals you know will react to a, a person who's freaking out in a negative way so apparently in the bardo <clears throat> it's a similar situation except the thing that you're reflecting it's just all reflection meaning that you're going to see a more vivid, potentially more vivid uh, representation of your karma in the bardo. And so uh, if you don't recognize, in the same way, if you don't recognize that people around you, maybe they're not the 
assholes, but you're just, you've been online too much and you've like adopted a paranoid version of default reality that's being reflected off of them. Um, if you don't see in the Bardo, if you don't remember or recognize, oh, I'm seeing myself. This is, I'm, I'm you know, I don't know if you've ever done ketamine, but, or, or any psychedelic, you, it's, it's, you can experience your projections like this, you know, you can, you know, just through using any kind of basic practice, if you're in a ketamine hell realm and you start shifting your consciousness just a little bit, bring to mind a guru or someone you love or a, say a mantra, so almost instantly what was like the worst things you've ever seen in your life will suddenly start smiling and then you're out. So this is the method of navigating the bardo if you want to stick around here, which is step one, don't freak out. Step two, remember you're seeing yourself. This is you. In the Tibetan book, of the, the bardo thought all, this is what they're, they read to the dead people. Like you're seeing this and that. Remember, this is you. This is you. This is you. And then, so at least you can take your, take your next birth without the momentum of fear running evading or you know like freaking the fuck out and then in that in in taking your next birth you might have a little more control over it than you know it's the difference between like you know running screaming from a bear or having some experience and dealing with bears like if you've ever seen anyone who knows a hunter who's around a bear they don't fucking run from it you know a lot of times they'll like scare the bear away by like no, the bears because the logic being the bear is going to be way faster than you it can climb trees so you're probably not going to outrun a bear similarly i would imagine in the bardo maybe i don't know there's that possibility too so is the dmt realm the bardo the ketamine realm the bardo i would imagine if you're a psychedelic has within it a component of allowing you to uh, see your projections in 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 colorful ways that aren't usual then i would guess that could give you some sense of what maybe it's like there the yeah, difference think- of course is when you smoke dmt if you have any lucidity within that situation you know you're coming down if you take acid you know you're coming down the problem with is when, when you go into the bardo you don't have a body anymore you don't have a body so that is not what you're used to and if you are a materialist and you've like your whole life just assumed it's infinite nothingness and oblivion this is going to be a real shocker when all of a sudden there's consciousness minus body this can be really disturbing to people who haven't like thought it through all the way i think that the framework you're describing there the kind of wisdom of, of understanding how much is is projection, how much is a kind of fabrication of what's going on inside us. I think that has as much application in this level of reality as well, you know, like, uh, yeah, especially socially, like, so much if you think of the most like, unpleasant things that go on in human society, kind of like hate groups, you know, like, all of that, I think you can really understand as as this process of projection, like it's, it's something that's going on with that individual, you know, you see this with people who have left kind of extremist groups who speak about what they experience, usually their stories of vulnerability and wounding and pain and fear and all that gets channeled into, I hate the, that group of people, but it's yeah. nothing to do with that group of people, right? It's it's a projection, it's it's this fabrication. And I think so much of our lives, um, and in some traditions, you know, everything we ever experience, you can understand as fabrication. Um, and I think there's something to that. And so I think, I think yeah. globally, like, you know, if the more people switch onto this, this perspective, it, it kind of gives you more breathing room, you know, if, if you can just take that moment to, to become aware of what's going on in you experientially, and it, it just creates a bit of space in your reactivity, instead of just someone, someone looks at you a certain way, triggers something in your mind, and, and instead of just really being attached to that and thinking that guy doesn't like me, I'm going to be re- reactive. If there's a moment of, oh, like, I'm feeling a certain way, could this be something coming within from within me rather than something objective about the situation i think that's that's a real master psychological process that can solve a lot of things it's a relief i mean this is the the um the 
it's so the you know if you're like we live in such a, a hyper connected world right now that hyper connectivity has always been there via you know respiratory processes symbiotic relationships even like uh the the workings of physiologically of the human body the all the different like uh, things that some of them that don't even share your dna are like harmonizing to allow you to ex have a human birth uh and now all of a sudden because of uh the 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 wealth of information out there you turn on the tv and you are being shown visions of such horror they might be happening far away but and and normally the amount of time it would take for those visions of horror to make their way to wherever you live if they ever got there was predicated by the fastest mechanism of delivering information at one point it was boats you know that was it or a horse or a messenger someone running or something like that now it's like that someone gets eaten by a fucking bear the planet's gonna hear about that within like an hour, two hours holy shit this guy got eaten by a fucking bear it's gonna be on the front page of reddit and so this is a perfect condition to create like all kinds of stress and then also whenever there's something in your environment that seems dangerous you naturally want to do what you can to protect yourself from that thing in your environment i don't think that you the, that many people are able to distinguish like there's no bears in t in texas you you don't you don't need to worry about getting eaten by a bear here you, they, you might know that logically but some deeper part of yourself when you're going outside it's like fuck i hope i don't get eaten by a bear so but so and not just that climate change war all the things you want to fix it we live in the other quality of society is we're fucking centralized man everybody wants to be the messiah all the stories are messianic so if if you hear these things you suddenly you want to save the world like now i'm going to save the world and you come up with like wild ideas of, of how you might do this like inevitably there's aggression associated with it even if you don't know that what you're really doing is trying to deal with bears you think you're doing something like compassionate for the world and the whole time in your planning and your strategizing and your social action you can accidentally forget the fact that you are freaking the fuck out right now. And that that getting rid of all the bears in the world, training all the bears in the world not to eat people, stopping all the wars, fixing the planet completely, removing climate change, cooling the environment, curing cancer, getting food to the poor. If we could press a button and do that, you're still gonna be freaking the fuck out. And so, what's exciting about this idea of like uh, working on oneself initially or in conjunction with all the other stuff is that it gives you something that you can actually touch, that you can actually do, that, that, that is well within your control to start being compassionate to yourself. And that compassion doesn't just look like, I love you, Duncan, or, it's okay that you did that thing at that point. That's great. But real compassion looks like, at least to me, it looks like slowing down, getting, a, seeing, can you slow down a little bit? Do you always have to be running around? Do you, do you always have to make, be making these demands of your body and your mind all day long? Is that really even efficient? Is it, are there maybe other ways of you operating on the, planet that aren't like you, tomorrow the world is going to collapse and so then then suddenly within that whatever that is which is usually called a spiritual practice or a practice or self-care or whatever this magical thing starts happening that which is that the world begins to change it's not quite as sinister out there you're you're partner or the people at work what are they getting night what's going on why are they why do they seem so much kinder or i'm actually starting to like that asshole who i hated listening to the 
everything about him. Suddenly, like, I, I don't quite hate that person as much. They're, why are they changing? Are they meditating too? Are they chanting Hare Krishna too? What's happening here? And so then that's, you begin to realize, oh my God, the movie that I'm, I'm beginning to project a different movie out into the world on all these various screens. And that is to me from there, that's where you might start getting the real spontaneous inspiration or moments of compassion that are going to, that, that collectively, if we all started doing that, would be the pathway towards a more peaceful world. Yeah, I really agree with that, that perspective today. So I think, you know, especially the idea that if you imagine in an instant, you can materially fix all the problems. I completely agree that a second later, just stuff would go completely chaotic from just all the all the neurosis that's still in the system. So like, you know, I'm currently setting up a retreat center in Portugal and, and you know, coming from, from England, I'm, you know, brought up in the mindset where you know, I own my own chainsaw, I own my own like individual thing of all the different tools I need. But actually here, there's a lot of like kind of communal ownership of, you know, almost like a library principle where do you really need 20 chainsaws for the 20 different households in the village? Could you have right. like, you know, and this fits in, in the degrowth movement when we talk about climate change. I think this is actually an incredibly powerful and probably necessary thing you need to do to shift from a wasteful society that's actually like, let's actually sell as many things as possible, get people to throw them away and crazy, you know, ramping up production just for growth and profit. Whereas instead of this wise kind of, you know, this library principle of sharing resources, but I feel like say you immediately fixed the economy and made it so like, all right, all these libraries exist and everyone can access all the things they need. Uh, and, you know, immediately if no one had done any inner work i think people would turn up and they would just feel this all of the projections of like i don't feel comfortable like interacting with all these people like maybe that guy doesn't like me or like yeah the the, the feeling of being able to insulate yourself which you know just basically like i've got all my stuff and everyone else can, can stay away from me i think that that kind of social anxiety is really a huge driving force behind so much of, of what's wrong in the world. You know, when you look at the billionaires who insulate themselves at other people's expense, I think that's part of the instinct is if I can just get enough power, then I don't really have to deal with other people. <laughs> you know, they, they can be yeah. subordinate to me. And that yeah. inner work is really necessary to make lasting change. Right. And yes, I, yes, exactly. And, and, and it, it's not to say everyone just do inner work now. We're just going to do inner work. Right. <laughs> We're just going to ignore all the other bullshit. And if we all do the inner work, then that that's as idiotic as top down right. methodologies for like, you know, working with the inevitable problems that emerge when lots of people are trying to share resources. It's, it's you know, and this is what I love about Buddhism. It's the middle way. It's like finding a place between the two and, 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 and most importantly, like trying to like recognize like how beautiful it is. If you've had just the uh, flickering desire to help, it doesn't matter if that desire, the way your brain translates it is insane. Like there, you're, you're not going to do that there. You're not fixing malaria. You're not getting out there. No, you're not going to get a letter to Joe Biden. You're not going to be president. The oil companies aren't going to fucking listen to you. But that moment of like, I want to help. That is a holy moment. That's an incredible moment that should be celebrated. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, that holy moment gets met with the impossibility of it all how i can't and then some kind of sorrow or cynicism or pessimism ensues and then that comp that actually sets you back that that makes you give up now you go from resource sharing to prepping you know what i mean which they're not that far apart and you know as in the sense that both of them are pretty um uh, are, are, are good ways if you want if your goal is like improving survivability certainly if you're sharing resources with a group of people in so, any kind of situation where resources are no longer available that's going to help you similarly if you're storing fucking ramen in your bunker that's going to help you but 
you know, the, the idea is first remember that was the good, that was good. That was a good moment. I just had, that was like, I wanted to help. That's great. That's a really great thing. And then to me, finding a pragmatic way to turn that intent into action. That's the next step, which is there was that flickering thing again. What does that look like? If you, if for, if for you, you're like, well, I, I don't know. I'm going to start a fucking soup kitchen and I'm too busy to go downtown. I'm not, I'm not getting fucking backpacks and filling them with stuff for people. I, I don't know. I'm not, what am I going to do? Go throw change in someone's bucket. I don't want to do that though. All that stuff. Then you don't do anything. So wh what's something that you can do right in that moment or at that day that doesn't involve like some like massive amount of organization depending on your ambition now to me i think that is okay i'm gonna slow down really just slow down a little bit can you slow down for a second just for a second it doesn't have to be all day long because really if we're gonna look at like the pro big problems in the world it's because people want to go fast it's you know what i mean why are there fucking cars we want to go fast we want to get to point a to, from point a to point b faster we want to get there quicker and we want it to come here quicker. We, we want it right away. And the, the way we're getting it there right away is causing too much carbon to go into the air. You know, so if, if you just can like start experimenting with slowing down a little bit, you're doing more than just meditating. You're going to feel like this insane momentum. Immediately, you're going to feel like this collective hurry that everyone's in and that's a pretty cool experience you can feel the why you want to know why that's why you want shit to get to you faster you want to get done things done faster you want to write faster be quicker truly want just feeling that it's why it's just a wild experience you know it's that alone is going to give you, at least it teaches me a lot about the world. Because if that's happening to you, it's happening to everybody, probably. Yeah, I think that's a great analysis that, you know, we're in, culturally, we're in this kind of crazed rush to for, for more and to, like this, this problem solving mentality of it's, you know, got to be faster, and more, just keep going. And to me, that seems to be kind of coming out of a kind of collective trauma, you know, like, to exist as a biological thing is feels very high stakes, right? Fear of death is a real, a real yeah. thing. And, and I think that it's that nervous, like, oh, maybe everything's not okay. So therefore quick, like send the economy into crazy overdrive to like get more stuff done. And like, if we just keep doing more and more and more, eventually we'll be fine. Instead of realizing that there is another way to be, which is to check around you and go, well, maybe actually things are sufficient for me right now. Maybe I can be happy with this. Maybe, you know, I'm at a place where I'm safe enough. I have enough. Um, and I don't need to be like, no, 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 more and more, more, more is going to keep me safe in this like neurotic, basically yeah. trying to escape death. Yeah. I mean, def definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and also the, like, I, I think just the thought experiment of like, okay, you, you have gained access to some ancient alien wishing cube. And now all those things you want, not just food, shelter, all those things you want, all the other stuff, use your mind to simulate you getting those things. And then think about the next day. What, th what now? What are you going to get the next day? Okay, I'm going to use the cube and I'm going to get even more of those things. Oh, let's go the next day. Okay, I'm going to use the cube again and get all those things. At some point, you will realize that shit doesn't do anything. And again, in the same way, you get this impulse of like, I want to help. The impulse to get shit quickly as some solution to your suffering is compassion. That is a compassionate impulse. You have recognized that you don't feel okay without this thing. Right now, you know what I don't feel okay with, without? The new Oculus Rift. Oh boy, when I get that Oculus Rift, 
and go into VR, that, oh yeah, baby, that's going to be, that'll be it. This will be the thing. So right now I'm playing the game. I always play with myself, which is like, ah, oh, do I really want the Oculus Rift? Well, are they good? Should I get a computer system and a better Oculus Rift? And then I'll play that game with myself for a little bit. It's distracting. Then I'll order the fucking thing. Then whatever the headset is, I'll put it on. I'll spend 20 minutes in some VR space and be like, God, I, I don't like this. I, and then it's going to end up on a shelf. It, it didn't work. And so that's the other thing that's a very important question. Outside of like the fundamental stuff, which you need for survival, really ask yourself, have the things that you have gained materially fixed the problem? And if the answer is yes, full steam ahead, baby, keep going. You figured it out. It, it worked for you. But if the answer is, you know what? Every single, this fucking Moog one, <laughs> I thought about buying this thing for almost a year. I bet I had 30 conversations with my wife about it. Like, can we afford it? Should we do it? Am I really that into music? I don't know. Do I need it? I should learn piano first. I got it. In the first few months of having it, I was quite proud of it. I, I am amazed to this day by what the sounds it can make. But now, eh, it's just another thing. It's another thing I have. The magic's gone. And so, you know, full, like for people to begin to, in their own lives, start exploring this very potentially difficult question, which is, is it working? And then being honest about the answer. I think is a, is a very important, you know, just in your own life, all the environmental stuff aside, you know, just in your own life, what really is bringing you happiness? What really is making you feel happy? And for, and for me, like having kids and having these moments with these beautiful new people that from the outside would look like the most mundane shit you've ever seen in your life, sitting, watching the rain, taking a walk, cooking breakfast for them, and realizing like this is a million times better than any of the other shit I was trying to use to gratify my senses. Why better? I don't think it's necessarily because they're my children, even though that is part of it. It's because now I have someone I can help. Now I'm directly serving someone, not because I'm getting paid to do it, but because I want to. And that, and so you start getting these like tastes of, uh, a kind of happiness that derives not from gaining at least gaining tokens according to like the current system like money tokens or fame tokens or whatever particular tokens are right yeah i think the that that kind of um deep happiness and and sense of love that comes in those moments is i mean I've not had my first kid yet, so uh, I can't speak to, to that. But um, but like in relationship with anyone, really, I feel like the, the closer, the wise direction to move in and the more you approach love is really just about being able to be with someone, slowing down to the point of truly being present. Like that's to me is when I feel the most connected. You know, you're not playing any games, you're not thinking anything, you're not trying to get anything, you're just, you're just being present. And I think that's you know, what we're you're talking about, this whole that. process of... Sorry. That's the secret. That's yeah. one of the big secrets. There you go. <laughs> Just that. That's it. Chogim Trumpa used to say that. You want to give your children a real gift? Be present with them. Just be in like pure reality with them. And oh, you know, that's that's like a that's how you do it. That's it. That's it. That's good to hear. It's <laughs> good to hear I'm on the right track. Um and, but yeah, I mean, I feel like this is true with its friends as well and relationships, you know, that's what we should all be moving towards. And that requires us to go inwards and do this inner work to face our traumas and the things that make us feel like it's not okay to stop and be present. Because when we stop, we're like, well, actually, there's something on my to-do list, which is to check in with that, those anxieties I developed as a kid. <laughs> you know, we're not, obviously not thinking this consciously, but there are parts of your system that are like, whoa, 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 it's not, it's not safe for me to, to stop yeah. and slow down, even if it's just fear of death, right? And so... I feel like psychedelics is for me at least they really help to catalyze this inner work process and you know the whole renaissance started with um helping to to people with you know cancer people with terminal cancer to overcome 
fear of death and you're yourself a cancer survivor, right? I wonder if you feel that with psychedelics, if that's going to be a, a major catalyst to kind of promote this perspective that we're talking about. Well, I mean, in my old, like having, to, you know, loved psychedelics since I was, uh, I, you know, I took LSD before I drank when I was in high school. <laughs> it's been a lifetime relationship that I've had with various psychedelics. And now, now that I have children, you know, my capacity, my, to take psychedelics in any kind of ethical way, uh, is, is incredibly limited. Like I don't feel comfortable. Right. I, I need to, you know, uh, Tom Papa, the way he puts it is when you become a parent, you're all, you're a volunteer fireman. Like you are, <laughs> you gotta be ready because yeah. they, you know, that you gotta be ready at all times. And so for me, like the days of like getting blasted, going on ketamine binges and all those things. I think that at least right now they've drawn to a close, um, which is good because, uh, not because it's like those things are, are, are necessarily bad for you, though sometimes they could be, but because it's given me a chance to really think about like, well, what did I like about these psychedelics? And though I do think maybe there was some, not maybe, definitely ketamine helped me work through a lot of my cancer trauma and help me like acknowledge my fear of death and all the trauma that comes from that. But there is a, something that can happen with psychedelics that is more than just a light show. And it's this present moment awareness that can happen. Like you're just here. A lot of people call this like dissolution of the ego or there's a lot of different ways of describing it, but really in retrospect, I think one of the things I loved about them was that they brought me into them. They fully brought me into the moment. Suddenly you're seeing things that you never noticed before. You're listening to music. It's like the first time you ever heard it. You're this, this world that, that has always been around you, but you just stop seeing it. Suddenly you see it again and you're, you're experiencing it maybe minus the stories you've been telling yourself about it like you know what i mean not like when you're you're seeing green just the color green right. and it's the most beautiful thing you ever saw it's it's so perfect and um so to me i think that is the if we want to talk about the fear of death it's important to talk about the love of life because the fear of death is the reverse of the love of life. So I think people who, who have a powerful fear of death, really they're experiencing their love mm -hmm. of life, but in a clinging way. And so just flipping the coin around, that's what psychedelics can do is you fall so in love with life that it's not even like you're thinking about at whatever point you, your body's gonna stop working. You're there, engaged in love with thisness, and um, also I might argue that if your day-to-day -day existence is one of avoidance of the, the heartbreak that goes along with being mortal, are you even alive? Like biologically, you might be alive, but are you really al alive if your every single day is closing your existence to a pin point uh, that feels safe, a tiny little island that you have like found in this ocean of unbearable ability. And that's where you've been hanging out. Your circumference is so limited, not in it like you're dumb or anything like that, but like you have so many preferences and you have so many things that need to be lined up in the right place just to get a, ah, this is okay. You know what I mean? That, that sucks because that means you're not going to get a lot of those. Ah. And if you're not getting a lot of those, ah, I don't know. Are you even alive? Are you even alive? What are you even afraid of? You're already dead. Don't worry. You know, there's nothing to worry about if, if you're, if you've closed off completely. Anyway, sorry for ranting so much about that. No, no, not at all. I'm interested as well that, you know, with ketamine, it's currently the only legally available psychedelic in um, psychedelic therapy in the States. And yeah. it's, it, a lot of people talk about it as if it's kind of like, well, 
for historical reasons, it happens to be legal and so we can prescribe it, but actually we're, it's kind of a, uh, not the center of the bullseye, right? A lot of people are waiting for psilocybin and MDMA. Um, yeah. But I'm, so I'm intrigued as to why ketamine was, it sounds like it was maybe a psychedelic of choice for you. A lot of reasons. I don't like the time commitment of psilocybin and LSD. Hmm. I, 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 what I love about ketamine is that you can achieve in 45 minutes something that to me has been immensely more psychedelic than any amount of LSD I've ever taken, like full merging with the universe, contact with aliens, all the fun stuff. The other thing I love about ketamine, I have a friend who's a psychiatrist who has a ketamine clinic, is that the light show and all that stuff, the visionary quality of it has apparently, according to research, no bearing on whether or not you are going to experience a remission of your depression. So this points to an actual physiological mechanism, whatever that is, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't think they've really figured it out yet. Cause if they had, there'd probably be a whole new class of antidepressants emerging that were like less psychedelic um, would be my guess. They're probably going to have something like that. Eventually. Is it neurogenesis? Is it who the fuck knows? Uh, so that's two really wonderful things. Number one, uh, you, you don't have to worry about uh, spending eight, 10, 11 hours. Also dosing, you know, because uh, psilocybin, you know, good luck finding synthetic psilocybin. And maybe with mushrooms, you can like, if, you, if, you, if you're very familiar with whatever the particular strain of fungus you're working with and you've got a good scale, I imagine you could, you could probably dial in experiences. I've seen the chocolate bars, this amount is this, this and that and that. But the, the, with ketamine, you know, it's body weight. And if you're not, you know, if you're using it clinically, then you're probably not insulfating it. And if you are, what fucking clinic are you at, man? I don't think you're in a clinic. I think you're in a rave, you know, but if you're, if you're, uh, uh, so if you're getting intermuscular ketamine, then, and you're with a great clinician, then the, you're getting the, a therapeutic dose, meaning something that's been studied as this is the perfect amount of the medicine to help if you're experiencing symptoms of depression. So these two things are wonderful. And, you know, I just, uh, so for me, it was always like a, you know, a lot of people have, they love mushrooms. They love psilocybin. Don't panic. It's organic, man. That's just a chemical, you know, there's a, you know, what I'm talking about in, in psychedelic communities, the hierarchy of mm -hmm. medicines based on it being chemical versus it growing out of the earth. It's, I think this is ri ridiculous. Every it, ketamine, did it grow? Sadly, no, there's no ketamine seeds yet, but I will be buying them <laughs> in my retirement, but everything comes from the earth. So, uh, Mike's ketamine experiences uh, when I was using it were so visionary and so profound that I'll, I, I, I'll always think about them. I will always think about what I saw. The, the, I'll always think about like the consciousness that seems to be working within that space. And um, also, I, I think like of all the psychedelics out there, it, like, if you want to make music, like there's something to me that was very artistic about it, musical about it, that like helped me like push past my own like boundaries when it comes to making stuff that I found to be really beneficial. All that being said, folks listening, and you know this, it is a it is addictive. You it crept up on me. I got addicted to it. I was addicted to ketamine for a couple of years not you can't get physically addicted to it but you can get habituated to it physiologically it can cause real problems it, fortunately that didn't happen to me it can cause bladder it can cause problems with the the bladder and you can really hurt yourself with this stuff uh and it can creep up on you because it's not always the k-hole it's like low doses it's quite euphoric and nice conversational even and so that's the road to addiction, which is like, you know, find something that gives you a nice little euphoric bump and, you know, and, and every once in a while, if you want to, you can, uh, 
go into an alternate reality, uh, mix that in with tolerance, which it, there's an extreme ketamine tolerance. You're going to start doing more and more and more and more. And now you're addicted to ketamine and you've got to have it that you're, you're spending money on a white powder. And so I would recommend limiting that form of usage. And especially if you're someone suffering from uh, depression and the antidepressants are, aren't working and you're always having to, you know, change the dosages and stuff. And you're going through that, which I have a lot of people who are always like trying to dial in the right amount. And it can be very hard on a person, you know, the switching from one to the other, it can cause vertigo and insomnia and all kinds of shit. Then I would highly recommend going to a, a, a good ketamine clinic and working with a therapist in conjunction with the, that medicine. Cause it was, it definitely works. I think, do you know this, the percentage? I think it's like 70 or 68% right. of people who go in experience a remission of Yeah, air. it's a crazy level of antidepressant effect. Yeah. Crazy. And, and, and with antidepressants, you don't have to go through the, the, the month of, of what do they call right. uh, onboarding or whatever they call it. You can, it's like. Yeah, the, for suicide the, prevention, I think it's really powerful, right? Because it's yes within 24 hours, you're like, a lot of people are feeling better. Yep, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time, Duncan. I really appreciate it. And and also for all your work. I'm a huge fan of your podcast, Midnight Thank Gospel. You. And yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for this great interview. Might I just add, I don't know if this is video, but if you've been watching me vape, don't do it. <laughs> this was so dumb. It's nicotine. Nicotine's so addictive. I'm I'm gonna go off the sauce soon, but please don't vape. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's so Good stupid. Disclaimers. I'm sorry that I am. It's it, it's an embarrassment to my <laughs> me and my family <laughs> <laughs> um where would you send people to if they want to look into your work more uh duncantrussell.com that's my that's where you can find my podcast and uh i've got a show on netflix called the midnight gospel and next year you could see me on this show that's going to be on fox called crapopolis oh great cool looking forward to that great well thank you i really enjoyed yeah. chatting with you. thank you so much yeah, for having thanks again me duncan Thanks. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.